Hallelujah, anyhow. Praise the Lord. Amen. So good to see everybody out tonight. Welcome, church, on Family Fellowship Night. Amen. Ain't it good to have Family Fellowship tonight? Praise the Lord. We haven't had one of these in a long time. Amen. This has been overdue, praise God. So we're excited to be here tonight. So good to see all you smiling faces. Amen. Praise the Lord. We've got some cool stuff planned tonight. Amen. I know our our kids are going to be very excited. They've got really cool stuff planned over there in the Kirtman building. So we're excited for them. Do things a little different on Family Fellowship Night. We have stuff for the kids, the teens. I'll be with the men over in the Kirkman building. Sister Becky will be here with you ladies. Live stream, we got a treat for you. Sister Becky will be with you tonight here uh, teaching you tonight. We're going to continue on the Idols of America. Me and Sister Becky are both doing it in unison. So I'll be doing it with the men, and she'll be doing it with the women. Uh, we're going to teach on the modern-day Molech. So, uh be ready for that. Amen. A good lesson in the Lord tonight. So let's get things started off right. We're going to do a congregation together, worship the Lord, get you loose in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So you can receive the Word of God and we'll disperse our classes. Amen. And and do that. At, at the end, after we uh, do our all our stuff, we're looking at teachers about 8.05, okay? 8.05 will be the cutoff point. That's what we usually about go to on Family Fellowship Night. At that time, ladies, when you come out, and men, we'll, we'll have it where you can come and get the kids over there. They're going to have a few things to take home with them, so we want you to be able to get them over there. You'll see what we're talking about when you go to get the kids. they they got stuff to take home with them tonight. Amen. You might not like what all they had to take home with them, but, but it's good for you anyhow. Praise God. It's good stuff. I promise you. Amen. So we're going to load them up this evening. Amen. We want to bless our youth. Our youth haven't been able to do a lot at the church this, this whole year, it seems like. And we wanted to do something. Amen. So uh, we're excited about tonight. Appreciate you being here tonight. Amen. So good to see everybody out this evening. So let's open up in prayer. And we're going to worship the Lord. I'm not taking up an offering tonight, but you can give the, the tithing offering box and building fund offering box is back there on the foyer table uh, throughout the night. Just drop your offering in there and we'll we'll get it for later on. If you do have money for the pregnancy care center, you need to get that sister Becky tonight is the cutoff to, tonight to get your money in if you gave, gave over 35 bucks counting the five that comes from the church you'll get a free t-shirt okay so if you ain't worried about t-shirt and you do have money come in you just don't have it on you tonight just get it to her this sunday okay but the night's to cut off for the free t-shirt okay so make sure you get that to her this evening um, and late there's uh two invitations on the back bulletin board if anybody wants to look at them it's for tim and hannah's um wedding invitation and shower Okay, a wedding invitation and a shower invitation for Tim and Hannah. Okay, it's on the back bulletin board. Make sure you see that and see the dates on those. All right, let's all stand, if you would, with me tonight. Let's open up in prayer. and We're going to sing the song called When the Home Gates Swing Open. Amen. I don't know if y'all remember me doing that one or not, but that's an oldie but a goodie. I love that song. Amen. It, can you imagine those pearly gates just swinging open and Jesus saying, Come on in, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. I know you've had a hard, hard time in that old life you had to live, but come on in. The gates are wide open Amen. for you. Praise Amen. God. I can't wait. Amen. Let's open up and pray. Just ask God to bless everyone that's here tonight. Amen. Everyone that's watching as well. Father, we love you tonight. Lord, we praise you. It's good to be here in your presence at your house, on your property. God, good to be doing a family fellowship tonight, God. God, we thank you for that, Lord, our time with our children tonight, God. I pray that you bless every teacher tonight, God, with them. Bless me and Sister Becky, anoint us, God, to minister to the adults as well. God, we just love you so much, and we thank you for this opportune time. God, as we pray, God, and we, we cast our cares on you at this time, God, we pray for those states that are in the path of what may become a hurricane over there uh, outside the panhandle in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. We pray for them, God, tonight that you would watch over them this evening, that you would be with them. God, we pray for healing in our country. We pray for our, our families, God, in this country that we dwell in. We pray for the election coming up next week. God, we pray that you would help us, God. We pray that you'd move in a mighty way in these last days we dwell in. Father God, we praise you, Lord, to be here tonight in your house, gathered in your name, ready to worship in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sing it with me tonight. Amen. Before we get all to our classes, amen. Let's worship the Lord this evening. Amen. I am on the upward road leading to that bright abode where forever my soul shall be free. Won't 
set me a happy time. Heaven's bells will sweetly chime when the whole gates swing open for me. Oh, that will be a happy day. To that day, amen. And them home gates swing wide on open. Praise the Lamb of God, amen. That's going to be a great happy day. Praise the Lord, amen. I believe we'll, when the home gates swing open, Brother How will sing that oh happy day. <laughs> oh, praise God, hallelujah, amen. Thank God, so good to be with everyone this evening. And may God just bless you and touch you tonight, amen. This time we're doing, uh, the classes are a little different tonight because we're having to consolidate things and do things a little different where we can spread everybody out over there in the Kirkman building properly. Sister Becky, you want to tell us how we're going to dismiss that? We'll probably start with uh, yes. Sister Kathy and Sister Peggy will start that off with the kids. Go ahead. Yeah, actually the three to six class, um, if we, Sister Marlena, you want to take them, get them lined up? The three to six-year-olds, um, they're all going the same place, but we want to kind of split them up a little bit. Yeah, three to six year old. Go with Sister Marlena. She'll help you walk over there. All right. Three to six. All right, guys. We're just trying to have them branched up over there. They're all going to be together, but they're going to be separate a little bit out there. All right. All right. So, Sister Kathy, you want to line up back there? Ages seven to nine, if you want to go meet Sister Kathy back there. She'll walk you guys over as well. Y'all give them a hand. All right. And it's 10 to 13. What is it now? Peggy's 10 to 13. All right, 10 to 13, Sister Peggy. What walk with you over ages 10 to 13. Y'all go ahead. they meeting you back there. All right, guys. All those guys are going to do some cool stuff. They're going to be on the kitchen side of the Kirkman building doing some cool activities. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Brother Jake, you and Sister Sierra are going to be with the teenagers tonight. Amen. Y'all go ahead and go on over there. Y'all give our teens a hand as well as they prepare to go over there. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Ladies, Sister Becky's going to be teaching right up here. Amen. You can sit wherever you want to in here. Over this area might be a little bit better for you, so you'll be a little closer. Uh, men, if you want to join me, go through the main doors in the front of the building. We'll be in the children's church area. I'm going I'm to teach children's church tonight. Ladies, you're supposed to. There you go, ladies. They're laughing. Amen. Man, I'll meet you over there in the front part of the, the Kirkman building. All right, guys. All right. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pass out to you guys before we get started um, some scripture references for tonight. There's a lot of scriptures. This is, yes, thank you, Sister Laura. Um, you want to go ahead and get one? 
there there's a lot of scriptures with this particular lesson so I didn't give you a copy of all the notes but I wanted you to at least have the scriptures because um, a lot of this tonight it'll probably be a lot to take in and a lot to even if you were taking notes it'd be a lot to write down so I wanted to at least give you all the scriptures that I'm going to refer to and you'll have that to take home with you um, some of it it might be that you want to go home and you know look into more uh, if we kind of have to skim over certain parts because there is a lot in this lesson but um come on in sis (laughs) all right so um before we get started and pray i just want to um say real quick to our live stream if anyone's watching um We chose to do this lesson tonight in our Idols of America series, um, the Idol of Molech. We chose to do this one tonight because the children won't be in here. Um, This is a very uh, kind of a troubling idol. If you know anything about the Idol of Molech, and maybe you've never heard about it, but this is a a little more in depth than we want our children to have to hear. So um, viewer or listener discretion advised, if you're at home and you're watching this, you might not want to listen to it um, if you have children present. If you do, um, you might want to pause it and wait till later. Not that, you know, this is from the Bible. It's not that we're going to get into anything that's not biblical. But there are things that took place in the biblical days that are very troubling. Just like there are things taking place in our society right now that's very troubling. And, you know, Lance and I have had to, in the last few months, have conversations with our kids about topics that I would prefer to never have to talk to them about until their teenage years. But they hear these things, and they ask, well, what is that? You know, they hear these things, and and so we have to try to give them the basic biblical definition the best we can, you know, and explain. But we live in those kind of days where you have to talk about things you'd rather not talk about yet. But y'all know, you've probably all dealt with that. I do want to open up with prayer before we dive into this. It's it's a lot a lot of prayer and study has went into this and it's very it's very heavy on my heart and since I've walked through the door tonight I've just felt the spirit of God. I could have just came down this altar and prayed the whole service and been fine because I have just felt God's spirit upon me. I'm praying that he's going to anoint me. That's what I'm feeling. So let's open up with prayer and y'all pray for for me and the men, the kids that you know this is I just want to start by saying, no matter what we do in this sanctuary, whether it's family fellowship, whether it's a church service, this is our refuge. This is our place to come. And, you know, the devil's tried to rob us of that through the last several months of what we've been through with with COVID and things like that. You know, it's like it's been hard to come. And then when we come, it's been different. Well, why? The devil has tried to rob us of our refuge. I'm so thankful that Jesus is with me, though, all the time. So it doesn't matter if I'm here, if I'm at home, if I have Jesus in my life, I have my refuge with me. But there is definitely some special about God's house. And you know, no matter what we're going through, when you walk through those doors, you can just feel it lift off of you as you begin to worship God and, and come into his presence. Thank God. I just wanted to testify tonight and start by saying thank God for his house. There are times I need his house so so much, and to be here is just Uh, a blessing and an honor but let's open up with prayer before we dive into this lesson father we love you tonight god you're such a good father we love you we worship you god you're worthy of all praise you're worthy of all honor dear god there's nothing that i could say that could ever help anyone but god your word is god it's uh, it's bread to our souls and god i pray that as we study this lesson that you would just anoint our ears to hear god anoint our hearts to understand Father, we pray that in every class and every group that you would just do a mighty work in our hearts and our lives. Lord, we just love you and we thank you for the privilege to be in your house tonight, God. And we worship your name, Lord. Give me the words, God, and give me your anointing, Father. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. So there's a lot of scriptures, and that's why I wanted you to have that reference sheet. For the most part, I will be kind of going in a, in a chronological order of what's on your sheet. So when you hear me reference um, a scripture, it will be on that sheet. But it, I do want to start with some. I know if you want to be with me in the Bible, we are going to start in Leviticus. So if you want to open up to Leviticus chapter 18. But we've been talking about idols. And... You know, all through the Old Testament, the 
idolatry was a major problem for God's people. And sometimes that is so hard to understand. Why did they struggle with idolatry? Um, when you just read a story here and a story there, it's hard to understand. You know, it doesn't even make sense. When you serve God, Jehovah, that created all things, how could you ever turn to a golden calf? But they struggled with this. And, you know, part of it we know, Brother Lance got into in the first lesson, as God called Abraham, he said, leave your family, leave the the Ur of the Chaldees, leave where you are and go somewhere else. And God pulled Abraham completely out of his family, his comfort zone. I believe God did that to get him away from the idolatry because they were already worshiping idols back then. And you know what I believe with all my heart as this lesson focuses a lot on children. Um, God didn't just do that for Abraham. God did that because he knew Isaac was coming. And if Abraham had stayed in, in the Ur of the Chaldees, if he had stayed with his family, he would have been exposed to the idol worship. His wife would have been, his children would have been. And the more you're exposed to it, apparently through scripture, the more they were around the idols, the more it became a problem. Because when God pulled Abraham out of that, we see that he didn't struggle with it anymore. Isaac didn't struggle with idol worship. Jacob didn't struggle with idol worship. Joseph didn't struggle with um, idol worship. But what happened? in Egypt when Joseph's family joined him in Egypt and all of a sudden God's people Abraham's lineage is in Egypt Egypt worshiped idols and so as time went on they were around idol worship in Egypt and we know it got in their hearts because when they were in the wilderness and Moses was in the mountain what's the first thing they asked Aaron to do was to build them a golden calf so when they were exposed and around that idol worship it became a major problem Such a major problem that here in Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 21. This is the first mention that I found in the Old Testament of Molech. So I failed to say that. So this lesson is on the idol of Molech. um, One of the most troubling and perverse idols that was worshipped in all of the Bible that you'll study. But God addressed it in Leviticus 18.21. Um, he gave a commandment and this is while God is speaking to them and they're in the wilderness he said and thou shall not let any of thy seed or thy lineage pass through the fire to Molech neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God I am the Lord and then if you go down we're going to go to Leviticus 20 now in Leviticus 20 chapter or chapter 20 verse 1 through 3 God gives this commandment again to Moses. So in Leviticus 21, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again. Uh, You know, very few times you'll see God say, Again. He's reminding them. I feel like that was showing the emphasis God had on this commandment. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, that means his children, his heritage, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Now that sounds harsh, but you'll understand in a minute why God was so harsh on this. And then in verse 3, he says, I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. In before the children of Israel went into the promised land, you know, have you ever wondered when you was younger and you would hear these stories of God gave them that land and you wonder why, why did God just let them come in and take over Jericho and, and Jerusalem? Why did God kick those people out? Well, the people that lived in the land before the children of Israel came over, they were already steeped in, in idol worship and they had become so evil and so profane that God was passing judgment on them. And this is the main reason that God passed judgment on them, was this idol worship to Molech. God absolutely despised this type of idol worship because what it was, and and I'll get into a little bit now, I'm going to explain about Molech, and then we'll we'll get into some more um, of why God was warning so much. But in in the land, God knew they were going to encounter these people who worshipped Molech. And what it was, it's a horrific thing, and even to describe it, it it makes you cringe. But Moloch was an idol that they worshipped, 
And it, he represented the sun. They worshiped Molech. He was like the sun god. He represented the light, the sun, the fire. And so he was that great fire is what they consider Molech. And so therefore in the worship of Molech, and you'll find this all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, this took place by the heathens, that they would make their own children sacrifices to this idol, this idol of Molech. Um, and there's several different theories on this, but the most commonly believed, and I, I believe it because based on scriptures, you'll read in a minute, they literally set their, some, uh, some historians say the idol Molech was a carved figure of a man with his hands out. And it, ha it was, a, I guess, brass, but it had fire in it, around it. And they would literally lay their, their firstborn child in the arms of that idol and burn it alive. And that was their sacrifice to this idol, Molech. And some say, in the, all through the Bible, you'll see references to passing your children through the fire, burning their children in the fire. This is always in reference to Molech. Um, some say that they might have just thrown their children through the fire, that they would have this fire burning and they would just throw their child through it uh, or throw their child in it. No matter how you even look at it, it's horrific. And, and you got to wonder, how could anyone ever come to this type of an idol worship? Um, in the very least, they said when Israel first became involved in this, they might have created two fires and walked their child through the two fires um, rather than burn them alive. But this is the kind of people that were living in this land that would, would burn their firstborn child to this false god that they created with their hands. And you got to remember that. They carved this idol and yet would be willing to put their firstborn child. They, part of the reason they did this, just to give you the history, was their, their thought was that by giving their firstborn child in this manner to Molech, it would procure good fortune for all the rest of their children. So by doing this, all the rest of their children would be healthy and well and blessed. And that's why they did it. But in this, in this worship of Molech, you know, if you think about being someone who served God Jehovah and you saw God uh, put the plagues upon Egypt and bring you out, part the Red Sea. I mean, you have a God that heals. You have a God that delivers. And how could you ever even uh, fathom taking part of, of some kind of false worship like this that would require you to give your child to be burned. It doesn't even doesn't even make logical sense. But I think it might more sadly more than we realize how they got into this. Um, and sadly enough, they did get into this. God's people. Now we're not even going to talk about the heathen. We're going to talk about God's people. And you know, it, it's God hated this so much that this is why he destroyed those Canaanites. This is why he destroyed them. Don't ever think in that, that God doesn't see what's going on in our world for a second, that God doesn't see what's going on in our world. It's such a grieving thing. Um, God saw what these people were doing to their children, and every single time it happened, it was grieving the heart of God. And, you know, the Bible refers to God having a cup of iniquity that when it gets to a certain point, and it got to that point with the Amorites, that's when he destroyed them. God does not put up with the shedding of innocent blood. And that, that's what I want to hone in on. You know, these babies that they would offer up were innocent babies, innocent children that had no choice, no voice for themselves, right? So you know where part of this lesson is going to go to later already. But in 2 Kings 21, we find where the wicked king Manasseh, began to take part in this same type of worship. Now, if you listened over the last several weeks, we've done studies of the kings in Sunday school, and we got into a little bit about this, how Manasseh was such a wicked king. Well, this is why Manasseh was so wicked. In 2 Kings 21, um, the whole reference would be in verses 1 through 9, but I'm going to kind of sum this, this up here because I just wanted to get a, get a lot of points out. But in 2 Kings 21, verses 1 through 9, you'll read where Manasseh begins to have uh, children pass through the fire unto Molech. And he, pa he caused his children to pass through the fire to Molech. And the, the Bible says, and it's, I believe it's in verse 8 or 9 here, um, but the Bible says that Manasseh actually ended up causing the, the children of Israel to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before them. Now remember, God destroyed 
the, the, um, these people that lived in the land before them because of this idol worship, but predominantly because of the worship to Molech, because they would offer their children like this. And now Manasseh, the wicked king of Israel, is doing the same thing. And you have God's people not only bowing down and worshiping idols, which is bad enough, but burning their, their children to this wicked idol. And, you know, God's not going to let that slide just because they were Abraham was his chosen seed. God never lets innocent blood slide. You know, we see that from Genesis um, when Cain killed Abel. God told Cain, he said, your brother's blood cries out to me. Why? Because Abel was innocent blood. God sees, it's hard to believe in this wicked, evil world we live in, but God sees every single person that is innocently killed. God values life. And, and I think that's, we live in a world that doesn't value life anymore. It's, it's, they value their cause and, and they value their convenience, but God values every single life. Why? Because he created it. Every single soul, the Bible teaches us that he formed us in the belly before we were even born. God had you in his heart, his mind. He had a plan for you. So God is very angry with Manasseh for this type of worship. And he, in 2 Kings, I am going to read this one. In 2 Kings 24, verses 3 and 4. God speak, or he speaks here, he says, Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did and also for the innocent blood that he shed for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord would not pardon. Now that word there doesn't mean they couldn't find forgiveness but what it was saying was God would not overlook it. He was not letting it slide. Manasseh had caused the, the Judah, the land of Judah, to worship this, this idol of Molech. They are shedding innocent blood. And this is how I know he says the innocent blood he shed. This is how I know that when they offered their children in this, they weren't just walking them through the fire. There was innocent blood being shed. And we know, and again, if you listen several weeks back to the Sunday school lesson, we talked about when the children, when Israel and Judah were overtaken. God allowed them to be carried into Babylonian captivity and Assyrian captivity. Why did God allow that to happen to his people, his chosen people? Because of this right here. Not just they worshiped idols, which is bad enough. When you can look the creator, you can look at the creator who's done so much for you and then turn and bow down to a gold idol, that's bad. But when you can look at a creator who loves life and gives you life and then you turn and take your gift from God and burn it on an, uh, an altar to the devil, God did not look kindly on that. And, and you you got to think of it like that. Um, you know, our children, our family, uh, children maybe, that even if they're not yours, nieces, nephews, students, whatever. As a teacher, I thought all my students were my children. But every child in my life is a gift from God. And I'm held accountable for that, what I do with that. And this is why we see such harsh judgment from God upon Israel. They, they faced, if you study that Assyrian captivity and Babylonian captivity, their lands were, that was burned to the ground. They faced a, a terrible time when they were taken into captivity. But it was because of that innocent blood that was shed to this idol Molech. And, you know, when I, when I study all that from literally to study this has been hours from Genesis to Revelations. When you study this, and you look at how God judged first the, the people in the land, the Canaanites, for this, and then he judged Israel for this. Does America think God's not going to judge us for this? The shed of innocent blood will always be judged. And so I want to get into a little bit more um, explaining a, a historical part, and then I want to get to our modern-day Molech. But just to, to have a full understanding of the historical, historical part of this, um, often in the worship of Molech, you'll hear references of the Valley of Hinnom. And the scriptures we're going to read here in a minute from Jeremiah will refer to this Valley of Hinnom. This is a small valley in Jerusalem, and it has many names. Um, you'll also hear the Valley of Hinnom is sometimes referred to as Topeth, Hinnom, Gehenna, or Gehinnom. 
And all of those are all references to this Valley of Hinnom. Um, Jeremiah refers to it, and we're going to look at those scriptures in just a minute. But it is in this Valley of Hinnom that they would do this Molech worship and that they would do this um, horrific worship that they did. It's historically reported, and this is not in the Bible, but when you study the history, it is historically reported that in this valley, when they would partake of this worship to this Molech God, they would have loud drum beating, and they'd have loud music, a very loud drum beating. And there was a reason they had that loud drum beating. It was to drown out the sound. Okay? And you know that... That hit me, I think, more than anything I've studied on this. Why did they not want to hear their children cry? Because that would apply guilt to me. That's conviction. So they would play that loud drum beat so they wouldn't have to hear the shame of their sins. And I thought, God, do we not do that? You know, do we not do things to drown out and cover up the terribleness of our sin before God and not necessarily me and you but you know I think we've all been guilty of doing that in situations but as a country as a world do we not hide behind things to take away the guilt of what we do you know and of of course um we've got to talk about the the, the number one thing I think relates to this modern day is abortion because you have and, and when I speak of abortion tonight you know, I'm mainly speaking of just this idea that any time, for any reason, for any season, any time, people think it's okay to go have an abortion, okay? That, that's generally what I'm referring to, just this overall idea that it's, always, it's okay any time, any reason. And there, there are states in our country right now where you can go a week or two before you deliver a baby and, and have an abortion um, accomplished. And guys... <laughs> Do you know in a lot of these places, they don't, they don't show sonograms? Why do they not show sonograms? Because it would be that same concept. If I show this person this baby, then they're going to realize this is a baby kicking and moving. And, um, and it's that same concept of trying to, to hide. I'm covering my ears. I'm stopping my ears. I don't want to hear. I don't want to know. I don't want to be guilty. I don't want to be convicted. I just want to do what I think is convenient or right for me to do. And that in that Valley of Hinnom, it was an awful place. And there's another thing that said they would, it was common, not only for the loud drum beating, but they would often be in a drunken stupor. So part of this worship was to be drunken so that you weren't in your full senses as well as that loud music. Um, that, that I believe that too, sis, because by that drunken state, you're not, your senses are dulled, and then you're not going to remember as much. What a, what a terrible thing. You know, if there's something... I don't want to remember doing or I'm trying to hide my guilt from doing it. I don't need to be doing it. And, and, and God's people of anybody knew they shouldn't be doing this. They knew, you know, how can, how can they knowing the, the, the words of Moses and the things they did know, you know, they didn't have the Bible like we have, but they did have the word of God. They knew God's promise of children and the lineage being passed down, how important that was. For, for them to do this was, was awful. And you know why I think it, it angered God also, not just it, because the innocent blood, most importantly, but God himself, he never asked us to sacrifice our children, not in that sense that it will cost them. If you look through scripture, God values children. And, and if you look through scripture, I know probably some of you thought of Abraham. The one time, there's just the one time in the Bible where God told Abraham, take your son Isaac and offer him to me. But you think at the end of that story, a command was given at the end of that. God said, harm not this child. He, and he didn't just say stop. He said, harm not this child. So God, I don't know all the ins and outs of that story. I believe God was, was friends with um, Abraham, and he was letting him see what he was going to go through when he gave his son Jesus. I believe that God might have been trying to let Abraham witness the intense, uh, t the, the awfulness of thinking you're going to give your child because God stopped him and said, don't harm this child. I, if anything, maybe God was trying to make that fresh in Abraham's mind. I will never ask you to give, you, to, to, to give me your son in a physical death. I don't know if part of that was for Abraham to always know, I don't want to ever go to that type of worship because <laughs> my God didn't require that of me. 
You know, God never required um, us. He's never required us. He's never required anyone to harm their child or to harm themselves in their worship of him. And, you know, what's also awesome about our God is that not only does God not expect such terrible things from us that we would have to do something horrific like give our child, God gave his son for us. <laughs> He's, he gave his son for us and gave, you know, gave us salvation. But, you know, sometimes you might say, well, we dedicate. Now, I think there's a big difference in dedicating and sacrificing. See, our practice is um, here, you know, when someone has a baby, we'll have a special dedication service. And see, God did ask that. If you look through scripture, he would ask them to, to, um, to dedicate their firstborn unto him. He'd say their firstborn. Well, that dedication was simply an offering to God. And you can think in the extremest of forms of Samuel. But given to God and say, God, this is my firstborn. You've blessed me with. Now I give them back to you for your service. But there's no harm on that child. You've just blessed that child by dedicating a child to God. So this idea that God, Jehovah, would never ask such a thing of them, but yet they would turn to a false god and, and give their, their firstborn child to a false god through a horrific manner, that was like a real spit in God's face. It, it was it was and not, you know, spit in God's face because God, if you notice all through scriptures, the firstborn is the one that God would make in the lineage. So it was a godly heritage would pass down the firstborn to the fir next firstborn. Um, and it would go from generation to generation. So it was the devil's plan. If the children of Israel would take their firstborn and offer it to Molech, they just stopped that godly heritage. Think about it, because God always would say, now I know they have another child, but you get what I'm saying. God would take that firstborn child and pass down the blessing, pass down the heritage. It was almost like the devil's plan, I'm stopping that passing down of God's heritage, of God's blessing. And we see this all through scriptures. The devil's plan is to kill, steal, and destroy. The Bible tells us that. You see it in when Egypt tried to kill all the firstborn. You see it where um, in the New Testament where Pilate tried to kill the first or certain age of children downward to get rid of Jesus. He, he always wants to kill something before it begins. Why did this idol not ask for the 10-year-olds or the 5-year-olds or the 12-year-olds? They would give their firstborn. Um, and generally it would be at a baby, at a newborn age or a young age. Why? Because the devil wanted to go ahead and kill that, off, that child off before they even had a chance. And if that's not the devil's plan is... To, to kill off our children before they even have a chance. Um, that's why, if you think about it, that abortion is so terrible in many ways because that life, God might have had a great plan for that life. They might have been a missionary. They might have been a preacher. They might have been a singer. Um, whatever the case, they might have just been a, a banker. They might have been a teacher. But any you impact people. Every single person impacts people. So when you take a life, um, you just cut off the possibility of the impact. And I, I saw something the other day, and I thought it was pretty powerful. You know, when, when a life ends, um, it doesn't just end with that life. It ends the future generations. That child would have been born. They would have had children, most likely, who would have had children, who would have had children. So when, it, when an abortion happens, it just cut off generations. Generations. Not just one, but generations. Now, in all this being said, I think we have to address this because this is a big deal in our country. Now, is there is there forgiveness for uh, abortion? Absolutely. Is there God's mercy for ab abortion? Yes. Um, this church does not just say, we hate you, you're wrong. No, we believe it's wrong. But we also believe God has love and mercy for that mother just like he did for that baby. You know, there, there's a lot of, that's what's sad in our country, a lot of young women are, are manipulated into these decisions without even understanding. And that's why, to, to, for just a brief minute, if I talk about Pregnancy Care Center, that's why their work is so important. When, when people go in there, see, our, our society has tried to beat the drum and, and numb the brain and make people think that it's not a life. It's just a clump of cells. It's just a, until that baby's born that this is not even a real life. 
you can't have that excuse anymore with modern technology. There's just no way. Um, when, you know, maybe 50, 60 years ago, they could have tried, and some people might have really thought that, you know, that maybe, I don't, I don't know how, because as a mother, when you feel a baby kick in your womb, how do you not believe it's alive? But, you know, earlier on, maybe some women didn't understand. Now technology shows us the heartbeat. It shows us those little hands and legs kicking. I, I don't see an excuse anymore for um, anyone to say, well, this is not a, a life. But um, our society tries to beat that drum and, and to numb that out. And um, that's why when they show these sonograms in the pregnancy care centers, and now we our local one even has a mobile unit that goes around. And they try to go to communities and get ladies that maybe won't come to even to the center well, why? Because it, I, the statistic's really high, and I can't remember exactly right now if it's 80, 90 percent, but when a woman sees that baby in, in that sonogram, she's probably not going to have an abortion. Um, it's something about that seeing and, and, and that knowing. Why? Because it's unstopping the ears, and it's opening the eyes, you know, and that's what the devil wants us to do. He wants to have our ears stopped, and he wants to have our eyes covered. So I have a few numbers I'll give you real quick. Um, the total number in the U.S. Um, up to 2018, and guys, these are always um, estimates because you can find different numbers on different websites and sources because truthfully, um, all abortions are not reported. So if anything, the numbers you hear are lower. Not they're, uh, I mean, yeah, they're lower. They're not higher. They're going to be lower because some states don't require to be reported and, and certain um, companies aren't required to report this. But... The estimation is over 61 million um, since it began, and they say on average in our country about 2,362 a day take place. Now, if you think about that in a day's time, 2,362, um, that shows why every one day at the Pregnancy Care Center is a big deal, <laughs> every one day, because they frequently have a woman walk in and, and be undecided or they're helping. And, the, and there's pregnancy care centers are all over our country. Thank God that people have risen up um, and took this burden on to try to, to, to combat this. But 2,362, if you have nothing else on a daily basis that you have a need to pray for, pray for 2,362 young ladies that are possibly going to make a choice each day. You think about that. I mean... You never know when God could use you to stand between life or death. Um, I want to get back, though, to some scriptures here. Um, so this, this Valley of Hinnom was a terrible place, and, and I'm going to read a few scriptures out of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah prophesied to Israel about how God was going to judge them for this worship of Molech. And um, we know that what... Jeremiah prophesies here comes to pass. I referred to earlier they were um, they were carried away in Babylonian captivity and Assyrian captivity. But Jeremiah said in 19 and 4, Because they have forsaken me and have estranged this place. I'm sorry, I hear pages. Did I go too quick? Jeremiah 19 and 4. I'll give you all a second. I have mine printed, so I'm cheating up here. That is also why I want to make sure y'all have that page because I know I'm going through a lot of scriptures. But Jeremiah 19, 4, he's talking about Israel here. Because they have forsaken me and have estranged this place and have burned incense in it unto other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. And again there he refers to the blood of innocence. That means there was bloodshed. They have built also the high places of Bel to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Bel, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it unto my mind. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And God lets us know very clearly in Jeremiah 19 and 5, he commanded not. God has not commanded any child to be sacrificed. He said, I've not spoke it, and neither came it from my mind. It didn't even enter God's mind. That was never part of God's plan was for children to be sacrificed. That was never part of God's will. Um, now, you notice here it says bell, because 
when when they began to do this into Baal or um, Molech, then this also became part of worship to Baal as well. Um, you know, in the beginning of history and things like that, even Baal didn't require such a great sacrifice. Um, this false god Baal, he doesn't really require anything. But they didn't give this into Baal. But as time went on, even Baal became something that they would sacrifice their children to. I think it kind of shows, you know, the, the progression of sin. If you ever steep to a certain level that of, of something you do for Satan, he's not going to just let you stop here. It's going to be required at, at every point. It's going to get progressively worse. And the children of Israel, it got progressively worse. And this idol worship t- and this, this killing of innocent children, um, it, it this, there was a really great statement I'm going to read, and this was from Matthew Henry Commentary. He, this is why he says God was so angry with this. Um, he said, As if idolatry and murder committed separately were not bad enough to God and man, they put them together, consolidated them into one complica- complicated crime of burning their children in the fire to bell. You know, God hated both of those things. God's always hated murder, the shedding of innocent blood. And God hated idolatry. So what did they do? They took those two worst things and put them together and made it one. Not just were they worshiping idols, but they were also committing murder. Um, And he said, this was defiant to all laws, both natural and of revealed religion. He said, mankind was more guilty of this than of any other crime that has ever been committed over time. Um, He said, what a cruel task mask taskmaster that would require a human sacrifice when the Lord Jehovah who all lives and souls belong to never demanded such from his worshipers God Jehovah never asked for something like this and he was the true God that created everyone Um, another scripture here I'm going to read is Jeremiah 32 and 35 and this is just you will find so many times through Jeremiah where he refers to this because he is prophesying to Israel against this. In Jeremiah 32 and 35, he says, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, so there's that valley, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not. He says this again. God repeats this. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination, to cause Judah to sin. So there God calls it an abomination. Um, and it says uh, one more here in Jeremiah 7, 31. God, again, he addresses it, but he says, neither came this into my heart. So three or four times through Jeremiah, not only does God call this an abomination, but he repeats himself, I commanded this not, neither came this into my heart. I think Jeremiah was letting them know um, that God did not command this. The land you live in, the people around you do this. Um, they're worshiping Molech, but God never commanded such a thing. So the first thing you know that was in my mind as I studied this was how did they get to this point? How did they get to this point as God's people who had seen such wonderful miracles? How did they get to this point? And, and I got to thinking about that first lesson that Lance taught about when the societal norms you know, I guarantee you the first few times that that they saw this, probably didn't see it done, but heard of it being done or were exposed to it, they, they probably thought it was horrible. They probably thought it was horrific. They would have never done it. But as they, God had told them to utterly destroy those Canaanites, get rid of them. And you heard in, way back in Leviticus where God addressed this, and he said, um, again, I say, do not... Um, if anyone, he said in, in uh, Leviticus, if anyone's even giving their seed to Molech, you stone them and put them to death. Why was he saying that? He was saying, get rid of it. Don't even have someone around who would do this type of worship. So as they continued to be around it, as they continued to be e- exposed to it, it became a societal norm. I, I think they got used to it. The pressure was there. Um, and, and you, how could you? How how could that happen? You know, that doesn't seem like a normal thing to get normal about, but it did, it, and it didn't happen right away. This was generations later. You don't see it through. Um, you don't see the children of Israel participate in this with uh, with Saul, with David, or with Solomon. 
But as these wicked kings continued in Israel after the reign of David and Solomon, um, you begin to see more and more idolatry slip in. So um, I just want to say, and, and, and I know you guys know this, but God doesn't overlook or take lightly the, the mistreatment, the abuse of children. And, you know, I'm not, it's not just abortion, guys. It, I know a lot of you know as well as I do. As a teacher, I, I was exposed to a lot of this over the years. There are children that go through hell. And you, they might not be burning in a literal fire, but there are children every day who are burning in fires that, that their family has created. And I think the greatest crime that our nation has, not just abortion, but the, the children that are here, that are born into families, and their parents have an idol. Because you think about it, they didn't just go take their children and burn them for fun. They didn't do it just as a hobby. They did it in a worship to an idol. They, whatever reason, deemed that idol was worthy of burning their child alive. And I have seen people give up and, 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 and burn their children spiritually, emotionally, for, way, for, for the idol of drugs, for the idol of relationships, uh, for the idol of um, uh, success or being so driven that the, the child's neglected. I mean, we could go on and on and we could list it. But it, there are so many children in our, you know, the numbers, uh, things to pray about, you know, and if God ever leads you. But the numbers in our county uh, of children that are in foster care without homes in our county is really high. And the number of kids waiting on adoptions is, is really high. And it's, it's sad, but why? Why are there so many kids that, that need homes? Because their parents, a lot of times, now, you know, there's always extreme circumstances, and I understand that. But many times, their, their parents have an idol in their life. There's something that they worship and value more than their child. Now, you think about that, because you always wonder when you see on the news, how could someone leave their child in a car for six hours? Or how could someone leave their child at home with various men while they go out and about? How can you just, how does this happen? There's, there's something that person values and loves more than their child. And what that is can differ, but it's, it's sad. Um, and I feel like this whole lesson's depressing. So I was like, God, how is this going to turn into encouragement? It, it, but it's a sad day we live in. But that's where we need some modern-day Josiahs. We need to be Josiahs. And if you study back in, in Josiah um, as a king of Israel, he rose up after several generations of ungodly kings. Okay, He came after Manasseh, and he had enough of it. And he, he got a hold of some of the word of God, and he cleaned house. He went and tore down the altars that were to Baal. He tore down the altars that were to Molech, and he no longer allowed them to pass their children through the fire. He got rid of that. During his reign of king, he completely did away with Molech and the worship of Molech. He spared probably countless lives through that. But, you know, when I was studying this, God laid that on my heart. We've got to be modern-day Josiahs. We've got to rise up, and we've got to stand in the gap. We've got to stand in the gap. Some of you already do that. You already know. There's many, many ways you can stand in the gap through prayer, you know, through um, the time that you spend with people, through uh, some, I know many of aunts, grandparents, people raising kids because they care, because they know that that need's there. They need to be that godly influence. But we need Josiah's because he, you know, it's, it, I, I can be guilty of this. I'm, I'm not a confrontational person. I don't like to argue. I don't like confrontation. Um, now, if it's family, I can love a good debate, but <laughs> it's just as far as me, um, me and my cousin used to spend hours debating in car rides, but, but I don't like confrontation. I don't like debate, and, um, you know, I don't, it's hard for me to speak out against things that overall society considers okay, because then they tell you, and I hear, like, you're the most loving, caring, kind person but if you dare say something against abortion, you're hateful and you're judgmental and you don't consider this one case. And they'll bring up some terrible, sad case, which is one out of every million abortions that takes place. I mean, I think we all understand there's extreme cases. You know, there are situations where something tragic has happened and, you know, and, and there's things that happen. But for the most part, that's not what abortions are happening for. 
That's not the, that's not the norm. That's not the majority. Um, but there are some extreme things and some sad cases. But it's hard to stand up and, and speak against it when you get ridiculed and looked narrowly and called hateful. And there's so many other things through the Bible where it, it's hard to do that. But we've, we've got to stand in the gap and be Josiah's. We've got to pray. We've got to act. Josiah acted. Um, how we act is different for each person. You know, God might lead you to, to when we contribute to things at the Pregnancy Care Center or when you speak up or you let your voice be heard. I mean, there's many ways, but the most important is prayer and interceding. You know, if you, you know a young... I, I saw something the other day, and it's so true. It's one thing to say as Christians that, that we are against things, but then if you see someone that's struggling, that struggles with a situation... Jump in to help them out. You you know, I mean, don't just say this is a sin. You see someone needs help, jump in to help them out. You know, it's easy for me to just say, because um, it's true, girls shouldn't be out committing fornication. That wasn't God's plan. And then getting pregnant and then saying, well, I'm not ready for a child, so I'm going to go have an abortion. Yeah, that's why God didn't set it up that way. And that's how some of these things happen. But then if I see a young lady that is living that lifestyle, I've got to not only pray for that young lady, I've got to try to intervene and, and let her know, hey, there's a better life and God loves you. We've got to act on these things. And, and you know, you might say, how? I don't know all the hows. I just know lately God has burdened my heart and I've been praying, God, how can we do more? Um, and, I've, of course, I've made prayer the top thing. But, you know, a lot of times you know someone personally, family, extended family, intervene you know let them know hey if nothing else i'm here to listen to you and pray for you and and help you with this decision instead of just we can't be guilty as a church and and we're not here and i know that in the past the church got criticized but not this church but church in a general because if they saw someone in sin they would just condemn them and say you shouldn't have done that well and that's true you know it, it's true they shouldn't have done it and they're going to reap what they sowed and that's the sad thing. They're already going to reap what they sowed. So while they are in that place where we can help them, let's try to jump in and not condone because it is important. You don't want to tell somebody the sin you're doing is okay because I love you. No, that's not the case. The sin was wrong, but I love you, and there's a better life, and God loves you. Let's get, let's find hope. Let's find a better, a better way. Um, and I got off on tangent, but but we, we've got to be a Josiah. We've got to find ways to, to be hands and feet to make a difference in, the, in these situations. Um, and I know I'm about, we're about to be out of time, but I want to hit on a, a few other things. Um, let's try to get personal for a minute. Um, you know, it, I, I had to search myself, and I think we all need to search ourselves from time to time and say, okay, God, are you first in my life so that my children I'm giving to you? And I, I'm offering them to you. I'm dedicating them to you. Or is there something else first in my life that I'm sacrificing my children to? And see, there's a big difference in dedicating to God and sacrificing to a false idol in our life. Um, you know, this is why even just serving God is so important. If you're not serving God and you're not raising your kids to love him and to know him, then in a way, you're put. Well, I mean, in all literalness, you're putting them in risk of hellfire, because their soul, if they don't get to know Christ, their soul's in in risk of hell. And so, modern day Molech, it's happening all over America right now, where people are worshiping something and sacrificing their children. And our children in this country pay a price for this every day. For some people, it's the worst that the parents worship, like we said, drugs, pornography success relationships media money addictions whatever it is and they neglect their children over these things so ours may not you know be quite so extreme but i had to ask myself lord is there anything that i'm putting before before um, god see here's the thing with god yes he asked you to put him first but when you put him first you're gonna your children are gonna be better off and, and they're gonna you're gonna be the better parent but God's not asking you to give up your children in worship of him like Molech. So we've got to be those modern day Josiahs tearing down the idols and, and showing our children the worship of God, Jehovah. And it's all around us, guys. Um, 
uh, some may disagree with me, but I, I just have to say this. It's a very troubling thing to me. And, and I saw this as a fourth grade teacher, and I've heard stories from middle school teachers that are even, it's even worse. But I feel like in our country, through the technology that we have, that we have unknowingly, I don't think many parents realize it, they have unknowingly just set their children in the middle of a burning idol that is so detrimental. I, when you have fourth, fifth, sixth graders own up with their own cell phone or tablet with unlimited access. Now, I know there's a lot of good parents that do monitor, but if you, and, and if some people just don't know. If you don't monitor what is on those things, I feel like so many people in this country hand their kids things like that, the tablets and the phones. They don't even know what TikTok is. They don't know that you can see um, how to kill your cell phone there, which is there. It's graphic videos that show you how to do it. They don't realize that TikTok will show you how to do other things. I wouldn't even say because it would make me blush. But our kids see it. I'm talking about fifth and sixth graders, guys. If, if you don't think that even good church kids aren't stumbling onto these things, they are. I've heard stories, and it's terrifying. There's, this, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, and... and same thing, you know, um, there's other apps I can name, 50 of them. There's, you know, uh, I don't even know the one where they snap, Snapchat. Um, sure, if you got two good kids, it can all be innocent, but you got bad kids in schools too, and, and you don't know, what, and, and it's there and it's gone. And, and, and so when we don't monitor and we just give these things to kids, I mean, when I was in high school, <laughs> I, I had books, I mean, <laughs> maybe a TV show every now and then. Like, I didn't have to deal with the, the, the temptation of pornography. It was, it, you might see it on a store shelf. Our kids, as young as 9 and 10 years old, they say the average age of a child seeing that now, it is young. It would blow your mind. Internet, YouTube, guys, YouTube. I mean, I know all of our kids know what YouTube is, but I'm telling you, if you don't monitor YouTube, anything and everything is on YouTube. So is YouTube bad in itself? No, that's not what I'm saying. But can you give a child that doesn't have the judgment yet to decide if they want strawberry or grape jelly and give them a phone and expect them to be mature enough to make decisions on what's right and what's wrong? It, to me, that is a scary, scary thing, and, and that's like the, just offering up your child to the God of em entertainment and saying, here, hope it goes well for you. And, you know, I don't think parents do that knowingly. Understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Most parents have no idea what's on those things. Some do, but they just think my kid's not going to do that. Your kid don't have to do it. It'll pop up. <laughs> Somebody, it, it will pop up. <laughs> you can't erase it. <laughs> And isn't that, isn't that the devil's tactic? Again, he wanted them when they was babies. Why? If he can get them at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, whatever young age, they see these things. Even take something like they watch a kid cut their wrist, okay? And that kind of stuff's all over YouTube, all over TikTok, all over. They watch that. that most kids are not even going to think about things like that. You know, if you they're pretty much raised in a good home, life's pretty good. They're probably not going to think about that. Um, but then you see it, that seed's planted. You're having a bad day, then you have a friend at school tell you they've done it, or you see it on them. It's there. Just the possibility of it being in your head is dangerous enough that it might be something now that's in my mind to resort to. It's a scary thing. So we've got to pray. We've got to pray like never before. That's the whole conclusion of this is let's pray like never before. That the devil hadn't changed his tactics. The same tactic of the loud drums so people wouldn't know, really feel guilty for what was going on is the same tactic that he's using with us now. Um, and, and so, okay, my time is up. He's about to turn it off. But that the devil hasn't changed his tactics. So that's the same thing he was doing then. He's still doing now. So to end this on a little bit of uh, good news, because I know this was not a good lesson, but the end it on good news is, is let's pray. <laughs> 
um, let, let's pray for our children and our youth like never before. And, and let's have a burden and, and let's stand in the gap and let's be Josiah's. Love you guys. Um, I think you want them to go ahead over and if you have children, you can.